Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cheese In-Depth, and I'm Michael Landis, and today we're really fortunate to have two wonderful friends of mine, Irene and Joan with Effie's Homemade Biscuits. And we've worked together for a long time. I have adored their, their products from afar and have always wanted to be able to tell their story because it's very unique. And there's a lot of products out there that you can grab with your cheeses and, and do different things with, but there's a difference in the quality and uh, also in the history that you will be able to experience here. And I'm really excited to, <laughs> to be able to have them on and to be able to talk about their products. And we're gonna do some pairing, some really fun stuff. And you can really see the diversity of these biscuits. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to my friends, Joan and Irene. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Michael. And I really appreciate your uh, including us in uh, this webinar and we love what you're doing. So thank you. So yes, we're Joan and Irene from Effie's Homemade and uh, we started the company 12 years ago. We were uh, friends from high school and we reconnected after many years through a, a mutual friend. I was going through a career change and getting into the culinary business. And Joan was already an accomplished chef and had moved back to Boston uh, and was doing catering. And we reconnected after high school, probably about like 20 years or so. And uh, we were kicking around a couple of ideas for our business and uh, we decided, well, let's, let's try some. And when, after we, looked into a restaurant and a, and a retail store with a cooking school and a, a couple of business plans. Many. Sorry. <laughs> Many. Many. And um, one that just kept resonating and, and coming back to us was the idea of um, wholesaling a line of biscuits. And we wanted to start with Joan's uh, mother's a recipe for oat cakes. It was something that Joan grew up with and she was already selling it in her catering shop. I knew that it was pretty popular and she also had uh, uh, some ideas for other products that we would launch eventually after the oat cakes and so that was that was the idea that was the business plan that we uh, we put together and we started the business at the um, beginning of the financial crisis of 2008. Perfect so we timing. were biting our nails a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> and a mutual, another friend said, don't worry about it. You have a, a really high quality premium product, and uh, those people will always be looking for that. So we did. We moved forward, and we started selling store to store, and lo and behold, uh, we are now in about 4,000 stores around the country. Insane. <laughs> unbelievable unbelievable we're always thinking like oh my gosh like we have so much we have to do so much we have to do and every once in a while we just have to stop and take a look at what we've already accomplished and kind of remember to pat ourselves on the back a little bit so sometimes it's been it's been a lot of fun um so i think do you want to sure. start telling us the story about how we created the brand of effie right Right. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. We're excited. Um, it's a great opportunity. So when Irene approached me about the, um, and by the way, I'm looking at her across the room. We're doing our COVID thing here so that, so I may be looking off that way only because I'm talking to her. Um, so when we, um, when we decided to do this, um, I knew right away that we wanted to start with my mother's oat cake recipe. It was really special to me. It was unique. It was uh, what I grew up with and nobody else really knew about it. Um, I had uh, worked with it out in Seattle when I was a chef there and then with my catering business here in Boston, I wanted to do the same thing. And people loved it, absolutely loved it. And it was so unique. And um, so we just knew that that was gonna be the origins. and. And it's not just that it was special to me or my family, but it is a um, part of history. It's unique. And um, it's really the simplicity of it all that um, speaks to the product. And, um, you know, you can en envision sort of like these farmhouses where 
all the food is made, um, you know, just some, a few ingredients and someone's thrown together, probably not even measuring it, you know. So um, that was really the premise of what we wanted to um, accomplish. And it was sort of our guiding light for how we wanted to grow the business it was to keep it simple quality, good quality ingredients, um, and not over manipulate anything. And um, that's what part of the um, oat cakes, um, you know, the, the history with the oat cakes. So um, let's see, so that was 2007, we put the business plan together. 2008, we launched and um, the, 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 the uh, Irene and I didn't know what we were doing. So let's just talk <laughs> about the sales model. So let's just be honest here. Well, first of all, this is um, the family here, um, and that's my mom, that's Effie, and um, the photo on the left-hand bottom corner is now going to be on our packaging, but that is my mom there in many shots. So um, the photos came, um, obviously it came from um, Boston, where my parents met. And there were many Canadians there. Many Canadians have their own version of an oat cake recipe. And um, it just so happened that my mom's family had one, my dad's family had one, but I had the recipe from my mother. And we could trace that back uh, at least four generations and um, trace that back. And of course the original recipe was made with lard um, my mother in Dorchester made it with Crisco and when we launched the company of course I went to butter and uh, we use our local Cabot um, unsalted butter here from New England and that to me was very important um, so anyways um, when we decided to launch the company which was in 2008 we're like well how do you sell this and I think from here, I'll give it to Irene, back to Irene, and give her some time to talk about how our, our fabulous sales model. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. So it was kind of funny because when we were thinking about wholesaling and, and you know, starting to sell to distributors and to retailers, Joan looked at me and said, you know, I, we, neither one of us has any experience doing this. And I said, oh, Joan, don't worry. You know, other people have done it and they've been successful. Look at Stacy's pita chips. You know, she didn't have any experience either. We'll figure it out. And um, I can tell you right now, it's been very humbling from that standpoint because it's it's a pretty complicated business um, and uh, an industry. Um, so, given that we did start off very organically, we were uh, we knew the stores that we wanted to call on who we wanted to carry us around the Boston area. And so we visited them and we gave them samples and they would take it. And uh, then we had to figure out, well, okay, how are we gonna ship it to them? And we had to figure out, you know, US, uh, UPS ground shipping. And we figured out this ingenious way of bundling the product to reduce the uh, unit shipping price. And then we started just dialing for dollars. We would go to uh, other people's websites and um, see what stores they were in. And we would um, start calling those stores. And the next thing we knew, we were um, in a lot of Boston stores. So we mm -hmm. started going out further. And I would take New Hampshire and Vermont and Joan took uh, New Jersey down to Virginia and then Florida. And we would just go state by state. Um, and we would grow it out from there. And um, then we got into Whole Foods and then everything changed. Whole Foods wanted us to work with the distributor. And so we started working with our first distributor um, in Boston. What was a distributor? Well, we, <laughs> it's our friends at Seacrest now and we right. love them. I know. So, um, that's no really idea. wonderful. And yeah, so we started learning how to work with distributors and growing our business through them. So yeah, we started just with, you know, our first maybe 50 stores. And I uh, now we're in about 4,000 across, across the country. So do you mind if I 
go on from here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the funny thing is, is um, we launched and, and, and we should be showing the packaging, but um, so we started with the oat cake and um, we knew the specialness of it. But the funny thing was, is that we would send this out to like a lot of these specialty food stores, a lot of smaller farm stands, independents. And we would send these out and we'd uh, send it to the manager, whoever was in charge, make the decision. And then we'd follow up and uh, we'd see, you know, did you like it? Do you think you'll take it in? And we were so persistent. It was crazy. Um, I think we had 13 stores for, <laughs> for, for about six months. And then we just sort of increased production and it blew up and we had 200 stores by the end of that year. And everybody was coming back to us saying that they love it by itself, but they love it with cheese. So this is what we were really getting back. And we already knew that, but we didn't realize that everybody else was going to get it. And we said it, but they would be coming back and telling us, oh, you have to try it with this tree cheese and you got to try it with that cheese. And, um, and so anyways, that, that was one of the big successes when we first started. We just knew we had a great hit. The other thing, and I think we should talk about this real briefly, is what has been a great success for us is we put samples in every case. Our retailers, from the day one, we had a friend in the industry and he said, people need a sample if they're not going to know what an oat cake is. So what we did was part of our marketing was to put samples, bite-sized samples, a tray of them in every single case. It costs us money. We make it. It's 5% of our production but it sells our product and it's really important. And I think most of you out there probably know that when you go to a store and you try something, you buy it, it's, it's great. So anyways, that was um, also part of our launch and our learning experience. Um, and then we got to the point, as Irene said, with distributors and working with a lot of larger um, cheese companies as well and selling with some of them here in the New England area. Um, and then it was time for us to go to the fancy food show. Da -da -da -da. Um, that was a big decision. Um, it, many of you may know about the fancy food show. It's, uh, we're part of the Specialty Food Association and it's made up of retailers and, and manufacturers across the country, across the world, throughout the world. And it's, uh, it's promoting smaller, uh, specialty foods that are made with high quality ingredients, small artisan makers, and that's where a lot of us get started. So we were part of this organization and they have these awards every year um, that um, every uh, June, July, June, 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 June in New York, and they would have these big award ceremonies and uh, they would give out first, second and third prize in olive oils and cookies and um, balsamic vinegars and, you know, cheese and all these different um, categories. And one of them happened to be cookies, crackers. We qualify for both because we are a cookie and a cracker because we're really a biscuit is what we are. So um, we entered our oat cakes that year and we got the gold. We came home with the gold and that was just outrageously fun. Un fun, unbelievable. We were out of our minds. We were crazy. And um, I remember, and Irene always talks about this, I, we oh. called my mother from New York. <laughs> I love this. We called my parents from New York and we said, um, mom, mom, we won, the, we won the gold. We won the gold. And she's like, oh, that's nice, dear. But just don't give out my number. She just <laughs> thought everybody was going to be calling her from all over the world, you know. But it was... Uh, it was, so cute. it was really cute. Um, so anyways, that was, that was, um, that was a, a, a big kudos for us and a good pat on the back. And we got a lot of media from that. And um, at a time when magazine publishing was really huge. So that, that was really, really amazing. Um, but one thing I do want to backtrack on, which I just touched upon a little bit was that what we realized when we had it with our product is that we're a cookie, we're a cracker, we're a biscuit. We're solidly in between. We're not too sweet um, a, a, of a cookie. And we're not, you know, we sort of fall into that category where you could eat it by yourself just with a cup of tea or coffee or what have you. So we realized that this was our niche. 
Um, as Irene mentioned, when we first started out, we were going to start with some other products that I used to make in my catering company, other crackers. And once we realized, wow, we have sort of this great little niche here. Why don't we just keep, keep jumping on this and jumping, you know, and flipped our, our products to that line. So um, it's been really great for us so far. I think most people appreciate the, the, the quality and the layering of our, our biscuits. Um, and to me, it's really important to have individual flavors. Not anything is overpowering, like having a, an extract in anything. You're going to have layers of flavor. Um, so that has always been sort of the, like say, the, the mandate or the mantra of um, how we develop our products here. Um, so then after the Fancy Food Show, we started coming out with some of our other products, which Irene, I think, might want to start to talk about. Yeah, I'll start talking about the, uh, what we did last year. Um, we started a rebranding exercise. Yes. It had been 12 years since we had uh, launched the, um, the oat cake. And we decided, well, you know, probably need to do, take a look at, at our packaging um, in particular. And is the packaging communicating what we want it to to the consumers in the store? Um, is it really enticing the consumers to purchase it off the shelf? Is it uh, clearly communicating our brand message? And is it just really describing what the product is and how to enjoy it? Because you know these things are called nut cakes, oat cakes, cocoa cakes. And it doesn't really mean anything other than the oat cakes are a real thing, but we made up all the other names, nut cake, cocoa cake, corn cake, et cetera. So we were looking for consumer feedback uh, to help us answer these questions. And we decided to do a, um, a market research study and through a blind tasting. And we were very specific about the type of consumer we wanted to talk to. We wanted to talk to um, our target demographic in the sort of baby boomer and above age, but we also wanted to make sure we were getting the feedback from uh, the younger, uh, up and coming millennial Millennials. set. They're very groovy people and they you know, <laughs> love you know, food and they're very sophisticated. I mean, when you think about it, you know, we grew up with potato skins and nachos were the height of sophistication. And you know, the millennials <laughs> are just really adventurous and knowledgeable. And we wanted to make sure that we're, we're um, hitting, hitting that demographic as well. So we did some blind tastings over the phone. Uh, these were like hour, sometimes an hour and a half mm -hmm. survey. Joan and I wanted to make sure we were hearing directly from them. So without their knowing it, they were actually speaking to Irene and Joan. Right. Joan was Jill and I was Renee. Just in case anyone from that survey is joining <laughs> us, sorry, we weren't being, we were not trying to be sneaky, but we did have to yeah. hear. Yeah. Yeah. And we heard some amazing things uh, from them. And um, what came out of that is a completely new designed box and that we're really excited about. And maybe Michael, if you can show the next slide. So uh -huh. we came out with this new box and the first thing we decided is like, Okay, we're not going to call them oat cakes, cocoa cakes, and nut cakes. They're going to be lightly sweet biscuits. So say exactly what they are. And we streamlined the flavor names. So other than the oat cake, which is its own thing, product, the other flavors are streamlined to pecan and cocoa and rye with walnut and et cetera, the expanding the flavor profiles. We are now telling the brand story. Um, of Meet Effie and explaining more and better who Effie is and the tradition that we're carrying on. Um, we wanted to clean up the fonts and the images and the graphics. And we wanted, very important for the retailers, is to have the sort of um, bi-directional packaging where you could, sorry. <laughs> where you could display it either way on the shelf. It could be a vertical or it could be a horizontal. And we love this and the retailers are loving it because uh, it just gives them a lot of flexibility when they're putting it out on the, um, out on the shelves in the store. So that's what we 
have accomplished. We're very excited because we're just launching it right now. You're going to start seeing these in the stores probably in the next two weeks. Um, they're, they started shipping to the distributors and they'll be uh, hitting the shelves by the end of July, if not sooner. And um, yeah, that's, that's really, we're thrilled. <laughs> And I want to backtrack a little here, I mean, only yeah. because the survey and the branding exercise that we went through was really fascinating. And it really did help us make some very key decisions. Um, and, and consumer feedback was everything. That, that, was, that, that was really the basis of, we were speaking with a brand consultant and we agree with a lot of what he said, but that's one opinion. When you have 30 people telling you very similar things, then, then key in, listen, and make the adjustments that you need to make. And that was part of, you know, and that's something that we've had to do all along. Um, you know, you, you, you grow the, the company, you grow the product, you hear some feedback and you take it into consideration. And if you're hearing the same things, it's like, okay, you got to change, you got to update. Um, and the, that branding exercise was really, it was really fascinating. Yeah. And, um, some of the, some of the things that came back only because uh, we were telling the story on one panel, we never told the story on any other panel, like who, like if somebody came along and bought a corn cake, which was our second product, they didn't know about the oat cake. So there was no tie into the company and the product and why is it called a corn cake and who's, you know, who are these people? Who's Irene? When somebody <laughs> said on the packaging, who's Irene? Like, so, you know, it we was got a problem. <laughs> so it, it was really key. And, um, especially for the millennials, um, some of the, the graphics were a little old fashioned and we definitely cleaned it up. It's a little brighter, but it's still the same thing. It's not as though we sold our, our, our brand or anything. We just sort of sharpened it up a little bit. You like to say that Effie has a uh, sort of a, a redo, if anything, or a um, makeover. A makeover, yeah. Um, so that that was great, and we're excited. And those are just launching right now. Um, our first production was about a week and a half ago, and so they're gonna they're starting to go out to the distributors across the country, and you'll start to see those in your uh, local stores. You know, one question that I did have as we were, as you were talking about your ingredients there, mm. do you use smaller farms or do you use, where do you source some of your grains that you use? Right, right. So I do a lot of the sourcing and, um, you know, on our volume products, um, we are using more of a commodity flour, but it's still the same specs as like, say the, the, um, King Arthur that we started the product with, you know, started the line with, but we also do work with some smaller farms and, um, one in particular, one ingredient, as a matter of fact, we're having an issue with right now, because I think due to the COVID, they're no longer manufacturing our, our stone ground rye, which we use in our walnut rye. And um, so I've been now sourcing from four different companies right now, and we're test baking this product to try to get it onto the market and try to, and, and what's challenging, Michael, is we want to support a small local manufacturer producer as best we can, but it's challenging for them too, you know? So there's sort of like a, you know, we're sort of tiptoeing this line of, we can't fill the need of say stone ground rye in a full trailer truck, right? And where, where some big manufacturers want you to do that. But at, at the same time, we're working with these smaller farms that can produce and provide the pallets that we need and then grow with them. And that's what we're trying to do because sometimes that's challenging for them you know, to try to all of a sudden come up with, you know, our rye cakes go on a big sale and, and we're selling a lot of it. They need to keep up with that as well. So there's like, there's a lot of tiptoeing and, and working with your suppliers in order to make the product and get it on the market. It, it is very challenging, but it's been, it's been great to work with some of these smaller farms and we're excited about that. You know, when we talk about uh, the cheesemakers as well, that 
when you buy a product, you know, you're, you're supporting the dairy farms and all and the uh, people that support that. So mm -hmm. when you look at your, your homemade biscuits and you talk about the sources that you get, you actually support uh, a lot of, you know, your butter people, your mm -hmm. ingredients, mm -hmm. you know, so when somebody's buying this product, they're supporting families and and uh, of small farms and also of large farms. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So especially um, the butter uh, that Joan mentioned earlier, you know, that was one of the few ingredients that we could source locally around here because, you know, it's hard to do flour and oats or, you know, in the Midwest, but at least all in the United States. Right. And, uh, you know, sugar is um, a big commodity. So, uh, but butter um, through Cabot, um, and uh, that's a cooperative of, uh, you know, um, dairy producers. It's something that we're able to source out of Vermont, and we're happy about right. that. Right. Well, you know, I think one of the things that is, um, you know, very core to our product development and, and what we want to create is the idea that, you know, our, our products are made with the ingredients that anybody could find in your cupboard. So... We're not doing a lot of um, sort of leading edge, new ingredients, innovative ingredients that you'll see coming, coming out. It's just very uh, simple and sort of trusted ingredients that you would find in your own pantry. Uh, and they're pronounceable. I think that that is a, a magnificent statement of the homemade portion of what you do is that, you know, it is uh, based on, as we heard earlier, you know, recipes from multiple generations of mm -hmm. what you were able to source. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. All right. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with, uh, uh, how about we start with the rye cakes with rye? Okay. Okay. I'm going to open up our, our beverages that go with this, Michael. I didn't want to ruin. Starting with the, the rye cakes was the, is one of the, the newest products and it's actually won the most awards. <laughs> it's won the, at least three Sophie's for, um, crackers. for the cracker category. And it's my favorite. I love this product. Mm -hmm. Um, we were, we had come out with three products and we decided to do two more. One that went more in the cookie direction, which would be the cocoa, and one that was more um, easily recognized as a, a cracker. It had a little bit more of a earthy, um, earthy um, European bread rye flavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love this product. Um, it is probably more of the cracker uh, identified as a cracker, and I think it's fabulous. One of our favorite pairings of this is with a um, sharp cheddar and a tomato type of chutney is, is fabulous. But why don't you tell us about what you decided to pair with? Because this is this is really interesting. I've been able to use them in a wide variety. Um, I, there's a lot of people think that just because they have some sugar or sweetness in them that you can't use them with tart. And I think it's the opposite in that way is that it actually brings out the flavor. But for this pairing, uh, I'm working with Cypress Grove with the lamb chopper, born to be uh, mild. And so it's, it's a nice, really uh, easy to uh, enjoy cheese. It's got more butter than anything else. It's got a little hint of tanginess to it. So what I wanted to work with this was with the Savannah Bee Honey, uh, the honey for cheese, and also they, they make, uh, they produce a uh, honeycomb. And so my favorite is really a little bit of uh, either the, the honey itself or the honeycomb on here. And it's, you don't need a lot. That's one of the things about the rye is that that brings enough flavor in here where we're able to enjoy it without having to create, um, you know, some, some major pairing. You, you can really enjoy this uh, with just the, the simple flavors. 
you know, you don't really have to uh, have 10 different things. You don't have to have charcuterie yeah. or anything like that. I mean, you can get crazy with that. And then for beverage wise, because this has got some sweetness to it and uh, uh, that buttery tang uh, with the cheese, I went with a Vienna lager. And this happens to be a, a local beer. Uh, this is a, a, a Crooked Thumb uh, from Safety Harbor. It's Harbor Lager. And it's just a really nice, simple, but you can see how, how dark this lager is, that it's got a lot of grain to it, which really helps and brings out more of the flavor of the cheese, the rye, and um, a little bit of the honey. Wow, Michael. It's a great combination, Michael. I love the, um, yeah, the um, lamb chopper with a little extra sweetness of the honey is, is terrific. Do you know what's interesting, Michael? Um, our rye cakes are definitely our best cheese pairing biscuit. I, there's not a cheese it doesn't go with from, from a very creamy, buttery blue to a bolder blue to sharp cheddars, whatever falls in between it is. And um, we've had the lamb chopper in one of our other biscuits often, but I never put it on that rye cake. And the rye really stands out but the butteriness of the cheese is amazing. And that honey is just a nice little kick there. Like you said, it's, it's, not, it's not overwhelming. I'm not having anything too much right now. That was fabulous. And Loved it. It's funny that uh, I do a segment for CBS, a great, uh, great day live. And there was, uh, I think four segments in a row where I had uh, cheese and I brought on the rye cakes. And so we're getting ready to shoot and the hostess turns to me and she says, do they make anything other than rye cakes? Because that's all I've ever seen. And oh. I've never really thought about it. <laughs> because they so universally pair that, that uh, you know, because, you, you know, when, when you're looking with cheese, you really want something that doesn't have a lot of that sugarly sweetness to it. And this mm -hmm. is one of the products that I think is so universal. And that's why I wanted to start with this is because we can use this across the board. Anything right. that we're doing today could be used with the rye cakes. And I Absolutely. think it's magnificent for somebody yeah. that wants to go out and have a nice little pairing. And yeah. you know, building cheese boards today with the way that we are, these should be single serving, for you know, one or two people, you don't need to get crazy. And um, the pack that you have them in, uh, typically for me, it is uh, uh, with another person, it is a single serving. Just, uh, <laughs> there are 22 stop. biscuits in there, Michael. <laughs> but who's counting, right? Um, the nice thing about um, what I'm loving about this, these pairings and that you're, you're, you're mentioning there, but is um, the, the lightly sweetness of our biscuit adds, it, it, it's not like everybody loves bread and cheese together. It's a classic, of course, but I think what our biscuits offer is a, a different level. It, it's a different, it's almost a, like a perfect pairing, you know, the, it, and it's it, it, a little bit more dynamic in a way. It's not just, you know, and, and it sort of plays off of the, either the sharpness or the butteriness of the cheese with the butteriness and the toasted grains of our biscuit. So it, it's sort of like a play with flavors. And I think that's what's so fun about our biscuits with the cheese, you know? Well, I have a friend with uh, 610 Brewing here in Tampa, uh, Chris Johnson, and he's a head brewer there. And he collaborated with this guy that, that they did a beer that was uh, pastrami beer. And oh, they used a spice <laughs> of pastrami. And you I imagine that, that with the rye cake? That that beer <laughs> and this rye cake was absolutely fabulous. So oh my pastrami gosh. on rye cake. I, I don't know. It's just, it was so good. So I want that. The cool thing about the rye cakes also, it was fashioned after um, I used to bake um, and, and worked at a bakery out in Seattle. But one of um, the things I used to play around with uh, was a walnut rye bread, a real European walnut rye bread. And that was sort of the inspiration for this biscuit. And then to have like the butter in there, it's like you got everything all wrapped into one. 
you know, and just caraway seed in the background, you know, not, not overpowering, just, just a hint. It is. And, yeah. and, and what I ad really admire about the, your flavors is that I taste the rye, but the rye is so well balanced into the biscuit that you're not tasting a sweet, sugary rye. Mm -hmm. You're tasting rye with some real quality in, breadiness to it that yeah. is got a nice sweetness, but not not overly sweet. Like I said, the pastrami put a little mustard seed on that, and you you can go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That sounds great. Sounds great. Where can we get that beer? <laughs> <laughs> you got to come to Tampa. Okay. <laughs> No, I, I, I think really the rye cake, it's uh, like we said, it was one of our last one, a little bit more on the savory end, um, really popular with the, obviously, like the specialty cheese counter. Um, it sells almost any biscuit, I mean, any kind of cheese there, but um, to me, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's very homey still, you know, it's not too complicated. It's still very homey. Mm -hmm there. The corn cakes, um, which are now corn biscuits, were the second product that we came out with. Um, again, we're using a stone, uh, like a stone ground coarse cornmeal, a smaller company. Um, we actually have masa in this biscuit, which is um, the, the cornmeal that's been treated with lime that gives it like, like if you have corn chips, it gives it a real homey, earthy, earthy flavor, balanced with some, some sweetness and then a hint of aniseed in the background. And what I fashioned this afterwards, after is a, um, an Italian cookie that I used to make. It was a cornmeal cookie. Um, with a little bit of anise in it. And I just love that. It wasn't too overpowering. You got the buttery, you got the crunchiness, and that's where the corn cakes uh, sort of evolved from. So this is our second biscuit, and we love this with goat cheese. It's like the perfect combination. Mm -hmm. It could be a fresh young chef. It could be an aged goat cheese. Um, we've done them all with this. We've also done a lot of like mascarpones and um, it, I've also had cheddars on this, but really it works best with the goat cheese, the tanginess and the buttery and the crunchy. It's a perfect combination. A lot of fun that um, people that we find retailers doing, they'll do a lot of um, Cinco de Mayo fun parties with it um, because it will plays well with like a, a pepper jelly, a hot pepper jelly, a chili have it with chili as like a sweet cornbread on the side. That works great. Um, yeah, so this is our crunchy one. I love this one. And I think, especially when we did, we did our branding exercise, Irene, I know that a lot of people said, oh, it's crunchy. It's great. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. And it has a little grit. It finishes with some grit, which is really nice. Um, just makes them unique. So... Um, when people uh, you know uh, meet us at uh, events and they say, "Well, what is this?" and um, I was just like, "Well, also think of it as um, if cornbread could be a, a cookie or a biscuit, that's that's yeah. what you get." Yeah, but with the anise, with a little anise, and people who don't care, really care for anise even are surprised that it's it's not the anise isn't permeating the biscuit. It's not until you actually bite into the seed that you even detect that there's anything. Right. And again, Pretty most cool. of our flavors are layered. So there's nothing overwhelming. There's not going to be a, a, an extract or something like that. Mm -hmm. It is layers of flavor that you get. And again, a lot of that is also our production method, which is very, it's a bit labor intensive, but it makes the quality. Our, our flavors aren't mushed together. They're, they're individual. So I always think that that's a, a good selling point too. Um, so, so you have a pretty cool pairing here, Michael. Well, oh, um, great. with the Beautiful. Monterey Jack, um, I just did a, a feature on Monterey Jack and, uh, I think it's a totally un underrated cheese. It is an American original. 
So this was created by David Jacks uh, in the 1800s. Uh, he actually named, uh, he packaged it, it said Monterey and his name Jacks on it and that's where it came from. So it's a really nice buttery cheese. And I, I think that this is something that works really well with the, you know, flavors of the corn cake. So we, you, know, you think about this and, and I thought about this like a, uh, a corn tortilla. You know, mm -hmm. that you get a little shredded cheese and this Monterey Jack is like a Mexican cheese that you would use. And so I decided to go with the Taste Elevated and this is the uh, sweet and tangy uh, mustard seed. So the corn, you know, flavor and the uh, uh, mustard seed uh, is, is really, is, is a lot of fun. I, I really like uh, the way that these, uh, you know, come together. Uh, that it is, um, I guess, an adult version of, uh, you know, using the biscuits because it's got so much real intense flavors, but at the same time, there's a creaminess and that corn that's in here. I'm from mm -hmm. Iowa, so, you know, mm -hmm. corn to me is like the, you know, like I, I, I drive toward it. I, I love the flavors of that. And so being able to work with that here and then beer wise, uh, I went with Lagunitas, they're hop stupid, because uh, with the corn and with the sweet and tangy mustard seeds, you gotta have something to cut it. And uh, so I needed something with a little bit more umph, and that's where this uh, hoppy uh, ale comes in. And this hops, you know, if you realize that hops are a lot like herbs, so you get that herb uh, flavor, kind of like, uh, I would say, like a, a cilantro on steroids. Uh, you know, so you get like a little, little taco. You nailed it with the mustard. That is really something. I don't, th I wouldn't have thought of that. <laughs> it's wonderful. It is. It is. I loved it. And I like the connection with the Monterey Jack and, you know, like a, a tortilla. That's, that's great. But it's that tanginess of the mm -hmm. mustard that's cutting in mm -hmm. and works so well with the creamy, buttery cheese. And then the crunch of the corn afterwards, the corn meal, oh, it's fun. Very fun. There's a fiesta Michael, going on in my mouth. We need to do this more often. <laughs> Especially no. when we start having beer at uh, 4.45 in the afternoon. It's almost five somewhere, right? Almost, almost. It's five in Nova Scotia. <laughs> I, I worked for a Norwegian cruise line years ago on board their ships, and we did a Mexican Riviera cruise. And I remember every time we stopped in Mazalan, we, uh, we couldn't do our dive trips because it wasn't a really suitable location. So we'd venture out, and we used to go to these little mom and pop places, literally on the side of the road that was, you know, uh, they'd use a uh, Ford hood uh, of a car as their grill. And so they'd be cooking over that and they would do the ground corn tortillas. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the flavor of that ground tortilla that they did right there has a little bit of sweetness to it. And so when you put all the flavors into it, you were able to get that more of a, a traditional taco flavor. But this is, this is the real corn, the yeah. real corn in here. And yep. I, I just love that balance in there with a little bit of, it's like a little bit of a sweet corn. It is, it is, but it's, um, as Irene said with the cornbread, but it's, it's not there. I don't know, there's something about, but that combination, the mustard, that was brilliant. Yeah. I remember we, we did see these pairings ahead of time. We're like, mustard, okay. And we both decided that we weren't gonna try anything out until we got here. So um, <laughs> it, it was great, it was so, great. I can also see the same thing if you were going to do like a pepper jelly with this because, uh, or, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Bonnie's Jams does a, a red pepper jam mm. that has got a, a lot of, of enough spices in it that makes it a little hot, which yep. like cornbread in, in chili yep. you know, yep. cools that would be really magnificent with this cheese, with having, you know, and I'm, I'm, I, I love this simplicity. This is uh, Basher's, uh, you know, Wisconsin made. Uh, they work with Ellsworth. Uh, a good friend of mine, Carrie, sent that to me, and I've been, I've been gnawing on that, that for uh, 
uh, about a week now. So. Yeah, and you, you mentioned Bonnie's jam, and we love Bonnie. She's a, a dear friend of ours, and uh, we've been pairing a lot of her jams. Um, you know, just, just about every flavor her jam will go with one of our biscuits. So yeah. um, we were so really good. excited when you mentioned that uh, you use her, her as well. Yep, yep. We're going to uh, step up to the black and blue at the end of this. So All right. Uh, oh, right on. Yeah. Uh, I love those uh, black Play with that. So. So anything else you want to say about these magnificent corn cakes? Um, we do, uh, I'll tell you, there's uh, a, another thing that we do with our biscuits um, a lot is we do make recipes with them. And um, so any recipe that you might see for a graham cracker crust, our biscuits grind up and do a fabulous crust as well. And um, I have to say our corn cake is probably our most versatile and our best in many of these crusts. So say if we do a, um, we'll do a lemon tart and we'll do it in a corn cake crust and then we'll put the blueberries on top or sometimes Bonnie's jams um, for a very easy, almost no bake um, pie. Um, we also do like cheesecakes with a crust or um, any, any, recipe that has sort of a, 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 a fresh crust in it, our biscuits make a great substitution. And I think with over the years with making so many different um, recipes, our corn cakes really stand out and do a great job. And it makes a really unique, um, instead, of it's, it, instead of it just being a, a regular graham cracker, it just adds a little bit more oomph to it. Um, lots of fun, lots of fun. So I think that's one of our more versatile there. Um, I mean, I'm good. You're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're, I'm going to get our next beverage ready. Excuse me. So this is great. I love the pecan. Um, I say pecan. I think Joan says pecan. <laughs> Boston accent, I suppose. Um, so the pecan is a, a little bit um, different from the rest of the, the products. It's less, I said, think flaky and it has a more of a dense, um, mouthfeel and texture to it and it actually what I love about it is it takes a while for the flavors to unfold in your mouth and it's just like the biscuit that just keeps on giving it's um, you know you start with the, the, the darkness of the whole wheat and the toastiness and then the pecan kind of kick in when the wildflower honey and um, it really just, you know, it takes a while for it to, it's meant to be savored um, and enjoyed and savored and enjoyed slowly. Mm -hmm. I consider the, um, it's interesting how everybody has a different, uh, you know, I don't want to say take or uh, basically a different take on them. Um, I, I consider this our homiest biscuit. It's the earthiest um, because of the whole wheat flour in it and because of the um, wildflower honey, um, it gives it just more of a, an earthier taste, if that makes sense. And um, as Irene said, the flavors un unravel. Um, it, you know, some people always said, oh, it's almost like a graham cracker, but that's because of this whole wheat flour in it. Um, it's, it, it is what it is. And this, biscuit is outrageous with gouda cheese you just take any kind of gouda especially uh, we do a lot of pairing we're doing we did some earlier the lamb chopper um the cypress grove does really well with it and i know that um in vermont it's um oh not the harborson i'm trying to think of the other cheese that we do a lot of pairing with but it's if you have sort of the gouda cheeses it does well cheddar cheeses it does well and any creamy blue, like a buttery blue, uh, we often pair our pecan nut cakes with cambazola and it sells like crazy. Um, especially when we do like trade shows and um, we'll partner up with other cheese people and we'll do these events. Um, we'll just like sell back and forth, back and forth, pecans, cambazola, or, you know, Cypress Grove and our corn cakes or, um, or our pecan nut cakes. So, um, let me see, what else do you think about the pecan, Irene? 
Well, we love, you know, it, it's, it sort of has a Southern, you know, yeah. sort of, you know, reminiscent of the South, something that you might find, you know, pecans are grown in the South and Texas. And, and again, um, that's, that's another thing that we can source, you right. know, locally. And that's been smaller, smaller companies that we get our pecans from. Um, you sort of negotiate that, um, you know, within the year, but, um, and you hope everybody has a good grow, growing season, but we um, use smaller farms for our pecans. And um, that has been a great introduction to understand that market and how that's all sold and how many farms there are out there doing the pecans from, from Virginia all the way out to California. So um, that has been a great learning lesson. But we wanted, we love the pecans and, and it's, um, again, I think it's one of our um, homiest and earthiest of our flavors. The goudas work really well. Mm -hmm. I find that you get into aging of the goudas and that's where we really take off into the maple caramel flavors. Mm -hmm. And Marike does a two year aged gouda and God, I love her goudas. And this is a raw milk gouda. So you don't really get a lot of opportunity for that. So this is an exceptional uh, flavor profile. And I pair this every single time. This is my go-to with Rutherford and Meyer, the pear paste. And this is such a simple thing. You know, here's the thing is that, you know, when you're entertaining, you, you, you have to bring all these things together. Well, with the pear paste, you don't have to be slicing pears. You don't have to be doing any of that work. You can just open up the container, uh, cut a slice out, and then add it to the cheese, and you're done. No other work needs to be done. Entertaining needs to be simple and, uh, and uncomplicated. So that's, that's the direction that I went uh, with this. It's wonderful, and I love the pear. I love these pastes. That when you put the Gouda together, you get a phenomena uh, with the pear paste of apple pie. It tastes exactly <laughs> like apple pie. So, you know, I, 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 I love that part about it. You know, a lot of times when you're pairing up cheeses, you get unique flavors to that. So when we add the pecan nut cake to this, it adds mm. as the crust of a apple pie mm -hmm. and brings it to the flavor of a baked apple pie. Mm -hmm. A deconstructed apple pie. Exactly. I love it. Mm. I love the pear with a pecan. It's such a natural um, mm -hmm. fit. And we've always done either sliced pears or grilled pears, but I've never had it with the pear paste. And it adds an incredible intensity. You know what I mean? Just, mm. So I'm pairing this up with a prosciutto. Uh, this is a Rustico, which is one of the oldest um, Proseccos in Italy. And it is an authentic Prosecco. And um, so you get that sweetness, you get the effervescence, uh, but with Prosecco, you get that peach, apple, pear flavor that just is, is it's a match perfectly, is they bring out the flavors. The pecan cake, though, uh, the brings out more of the fruit in the Prosecco. So you get even more of a, a, a richness. This is a perfect afternoon dessert. You know, you have a nice lunch and you want to have something really light, but something that is you know, scrumptious, that brings out the sweetness, and it tastes like you're getting your daily amount of fruit. It's amazing. Incredible. <laughs> we'll use this again. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite. This is my go-to, yeah. and I think that everybody that's ever met me, and then we've done pairings with Gouda's, they know that this is the best thing that you can do with it. Not the only thing, but to me, this is the, the number one thing that you can do with this pairing. And I, I just really, 
I, I can never say enough about it because I just think it's so simple, so easy, but so rich in flavors. Thank you. Oh, they complement each other so well. The Gouda that we have is not, I wish we could have found that here. Um, we have a nice aged Gouda. Um, and and the, I love that with the pecan, there's sort of like a, um, the nuttiness mm -hmm. all blends together. It, this is, whereas the um, second pairing we have, there was a bit of a contrast and things popped out. This is sort of like, all blending lovely together. I love it. It's, um, you know, it's to the nut and the nut and then the pear. It's just, like you said, it's like pie. It's well, delish. if you're not able to find the Marike, which I would say that it is a little harder to find, you can order it direct from them. But a, a cheese that would be a great, and what I've done before that is a great substitution is the Beamster 18 month Gouda. Mm. That. Mm -hmm is killer with this as well. So you can't go wrong with the Beamster. You can't go wrong with the, the Marike. So you, you've got two really good solid directions that you could go with this and have a great little, little simple dessert. But the Rutherford and Meyer, the pear paste, that's what really sets this on that different level mm -hmm. of being able to have more of that rich flavor, the sweetness, and that apple pie flavor mm -hmm. without yeah. getting into the whole thing. Look how simple this was. You just literally, you open this up, you slice it, you put it on, and then when you're done, you put it back and, and you're Clean done with it. Again. You don't have to uh, Clean up. worry about, yeah. about uh, what am I going to do with all the... Uh, 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 the extra apples or pears or, you know, are they going to last? You know, you don't, you don't have to do anything. You just open it and serve it. So you can have this at your convenience anytime, just like, yep. your, just like you know, your nutcakes. You can open them up and get what you want, do a little dessert, and then put it away. Michael, I was going to say something funny, but um, are you growing a tail? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. Oh, I Do you have a waiting, golden retriever there? <laughs> I've been waiting for my dogs to come through and start barking or something. Yes, and a very good dog. Going back I, I have two rescue golden retrievers. <laughs> we get, oh, nice. So, nice. Yeah, so they do pretty well. If I put them outside, then they, 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 they want to be part of it. So they're right. actually, you know, they were sleeping really well, but... Uh, uh, you know, there was a little rustle uh, in the kitchen, and so they had to go see whether or not they were going to get cheese. Right. They live on cheese. Right. So, I love exactly golden retrievers. Are, you know, they're, uh, uh, you know, good, good companions. We love our dogs. Well entertained. I'm with, I'm, will, I'm with you as well. My dogs um, love it when I'm doing R&D. <laughs> You talk, just put his nose up in the cheese. <laughs> I know. Um, my dogs take advantage of the fact that flour and uh, oats and all these things are flying all over the floor when I'm, when I'm, and so they're always hanging out underneath my feet here, like <laughs> licking up everything. I'm like, go for it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. When I was preparing the cheese boards, they were both, they, they, they know I'm, I'm not that well at uh, keeping things on the table so mm, they, they mm -hmm. are my uh, floor cleaners and they make sure that i don't have any cheese left on the floor there we but go. They also uh, when i am preparing samples in that they will they will go into the living room and sit there like statues knowing that if they sit there and they be really good they're going to be rewarded <laughs> i do awesome. awesome everybody's back to normal now so i shouldn't be okay. going to jail again <laughs> Okay. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. It is. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. I hope other everybody is out there doing this. The way to spend a Wednesday evening. Exactly. All right. So, mm. are you ready to go into the cocoa cakes? Sure. Sure. All righty. This then. is fascinating. I can't wait. These are our malted cocoa cakes, and um, we are now calling the cocoa biscuit. Um. This is sort of the sweeter version of our line, the sweeter end of our line, but it's still not too sweet that you feel like you're having a, 
super chocolatey kind of um, treat or biscuit. Um, the cocoa cakes, that malt makes it really earthy. It's a, it's a beautiful malt syrup that we use and it makes it very earthy. Um, we use a really great chocolate, um, cocoa, excuse me. Um, we're using guitar and um, we tried out, when we were developing this recipe, we probably tried out at least 10 different cocos for the recipe. Um, and the guitar was sort of that um, deepest without being overpowering. Um, and just, it was just a nice balance with what we were doing with the malt. And the toasted coconut is definitely a lot of fun. I think people pick up on that pretty quickly. And um, there's a nice finish of salt at the end. So again, it's not too sweet um, to have by itself or topped with a cheese, a jam. Um, we do do, and, and this is something we learned from the, 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 the gang at, at Murray's, um, a creamy blue blue cheese like a cabazola. Um, that shared on our cocoa cakes is to die for and then add whatever you want on top of it. But um, whether it's like a blue, blueberry jam or something like that, but just the, the blue cheese on the cocoa cakes is phenomenal. Sort of that chocolate blue kind of balance. Um, and we also loved, um, it, it, it makes a really quick dessert. Um, so say if you are entertaining and it's not a really rich dessert, you could have the cocoa cakes um, with some fresh fruit and either a yogurt or a one cheese or a, a mascarpone. Very simple. It's almost like a deconstructed tart. And it's, it's just a great way to end a dinner. Um, but I know I have a lot of neighbors that call this crack. So that's the other thing. It, it can be a problem when you open up one of these packages. So, um, so that's a lot of fun. Irene, is this uh, the cocoa cakes on? Do you have anything to add? Well, I think just in, as um, if you noticed on Michael's um, uh, photo there that it's also sprinkled with little turbinado sugar yeah. crystals yeah. on the top. So you just you also just get that nice. You get the salt finish, but then you get a nice crystal sugar. Right. And the nice finish crunch well. on that. And the crunch, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a good one. And I was doing, you know, before COVID, when I would have a dinner party, uh, I would serve a dessert cheese board instead of making a, you know, a dessert. It was just so easy to put out a couple of biscuits and the, you know, the fruit, I'll definitely use the pear paste the next time and just take it in another direction. It's a very European tradition to put, uh, have a cheese course after uh, dinner. And uh, it's really fun, it's really fun. I think you have uh, kind of an interesting, we haven't thought of this pairing. Well, you know, when, uh, when we were talking about this, uh, what, I imagined was that a lot of times when you have uh, chocolate biscuits and that the fruit is like the first direction that I, I go to. I thought oranges and then I thought something uh, a little bit more, I said, a, I thought a little bit more acidic, which the acidicness would bring out a little bit more of the buttery flavors. And so I chose the Satori this is their Belvitano uh, Parmesan, uh, which I just I love this cheese. This is just uh, a fabulous snacking cheese on a loan, uh, shredding and, and that. And then Bonnie's Black and Blue. And you guys have worked with this before, haven't you? Oh, we love it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're looking at, uh, you know, delicious blueberries, blackberries, and that tartness and tanginess that you get from it is really the direction that I was looking for because I, I want to be able to bring up the tanginess here or the, the buttery flavors of the cheese and also using the chocolate. So having the chocolate in here, having the Parmesan, which sets a really great flavor profile. And then beer-wise, uh, I went with Swamphead Brewery. Now, these guys, they do an amazing uh, stout. And this is what they call the Midnight Oil. 
uh, oatmeal coffee stout. So I got wow. oatmeal coffee stout, um, uh, the cocoa, cocoa eggs, yeah. the blackberries. Oh I have everything you need for nutrition and living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. Mm. Oh, I'm learning so much from you, Michael. I wouldn't have found this. Mm -mm. This is uh, this is the pinnacle of of having the combination of the fruit, of the chocolate, of the cheese, um, of the wow. salad, of the coffee. All, all these flavors work really well together. There's wow. Uh, but like the flavors that you put in, they're balanced. So mm -hmm. I'm not tasting all chocolate. I'm not tasting all, um, you know, grain. I'm, I'm tasting a nice balance of those flavors. And then, um, you know, Bonnie's, this, this jam is, is just so well made. It's not sweet. It's got that tanginess to it that you really, really appreciate that you, you know, when you have a, a blackberry and blueberry, you don't want it to be Welch's grape jelly. You want it to be really fruit forward. And this is all about fruit and with the cheese and, and with the cocoa cake. Oh, man. It, yeah, you know, one of the things we love about Bonnie is that um, her jams, don't have a lot of sugar in it. She really relies on uh, you know, pulling out the natural sugar in her fruit. And she doesn't use a lot of pectin. She uses the natural pectins. Oh, yeah. no pectin. No, no added pectin. No added but the pectin, pe say, from the, the cores and stuff like that is, is what sets things. Yeah. Um, you, you got it, Michael. Yeah. That was so much fun with the stout. I would never have thought of those two together. You know, it's... This is the new uh, tasting combination. It really, like with the cocoa and the stout and all that kind of stuff, <gasps> I'm loving it. Well, brewers have it's been a doing nice cocoa. lingering flavor. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. And brewers it's clean. have been doing cocoa, uh, cocoa or um, chocolate stouts for a very long time, and um, to be able to have an oatmeal chocolate stout with this, it just works really well in the flavors. You really taste the oatmeal sweetness in here. You got the bitterness of the stout with not being overly bitter. And then, of course, the coffee in this. Mm. And, you know, that's, that's the thing is that you could really take this as an after dinner. You know, mm -hmm. having a little coffee, having, a, having this with the fruit, that, that in itself. I could have paired this with uh, a coffee drink uh, or, you know, of something of that sort. Even a cold coffee would work magnificently here but coffee uh oatmeal chocolate stout stout it's for me we'll take it we'll take it one that's called what is it called swamp head mm. swamp head brewery swamp and head brewery. Uh, these guys this is their midnight oil midnight and it oil. looks like yeah. midnight oil uh -huh. so fabulous fabulous beer well, that was a lot of fun. I think that that's going to be on our little pairing suggestions as we as we leave here, Michael. We are going to be stealing some of your great ideas about pairings. This is this is a lot of fun. It's things we wouldn't. I would not have put a parmesan on our biscuit, our cocoa. No, no. I mean, what do we know? I mean, we make biscuits, right? But um, that was phenomenal. I love that. Love it. For Parmesan and Parmigiano Reggiano, I paired it with the uh, chocolate covered almonds and it does very well. So mm -hmm. I just naturally thought that they would be another really good combination of flavors and they are. Just by themselves, the, the Parmesan lends itself well to the, the cocoa cake. So it's uh, really nice, just those two. But adding the fruit in there, that, is just yeah it's that um i'm gonna skip dinner and just mm -hmm. <laughs> after this and finish this little cheese board and see how far i can get in that biscuit tray 
<laughs> yeah, as you say, it's it's great for snacking. It's a really nice, wholesome, Love simple it. snack. Yeah. Any time of day. Exactly. This All will right. be our new our new lunch at Effie's. You probably won't yeah. get much done. <laughs> I wouldn't get much done. <laughs> now there's the classic. Um, no, I'm, I'm really interested to, to try what Michael has put together today for us. Um, this has been fabulous. We wouldn't have done half of these things, but um, we have done a lot of pairing with the oat cake. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, retailers and cheesemongers were getting back to us. Oh, I pair it with this and I try it with that. But right there is probably uh, the most classic and pure. And when Michael was talking about an apple pie earlier, this to me is uh, the oat cake with a sharp cheddar cheese and a slice of apple in the fall. It's the best snack. It is the best snack. And um, I think, I don't know if this is New England tradition. I mean, is the, um, when they used to serve apple pie with a sharp cheddar cheese on top. Mm -hmm. um, is that, I don't know if that, but. The, I'm not sure if it's New England, but. But it, it, it was, it reminded me a lot of that. Um, it was a great combination. But again, the oat cake is super versatile. Um, if the rye cake is our best cheese pairing biscuit, the oat cake is probably the most versatile of all of our biscuits and goes with blues to triple creme, breeze to um, sharp cheddars. Uh, we've had goat cheeses on there, mascarpones. Um, name it. it, it does pretty well with all of the cheeses. Um, and in particular, sort of that sweet, sharp balance is, is nice, or the buttery, buttery balance. And Michael is certainly, certainly turning us on to a lot of those balances today, that's for sure. <laughs> so you, I mean, you have your last drink? I do. Yes. I do. So Michael, you've Ooh. put together a really fun pairing here that, um, why don't you talk us through it? But we've also um, done this a couple of times, mm -hmm. and this is actually an award-winning pairing. This is an example of that you can't improve. You just can't improve on this style. Being you being able to use the mascarpone with the uh, with the the oat cakes is just so classic that I didn't want to take it to some direction that would be. I think uh, disrespectful. I think that this is such a classic flavor that uh, it works so beautifully. And so the direction that I took, uh, you know, staying with you guys uh, in the Northeast um, with uh, Vermont Creamery using their very, very decadent mm -hmm. uh, uh, mascarpone. And then uh, again, another Vermont product. This is the, the Fat Toad. Uh, I, I, I love these guys. Uh, this is the caramel vanilla bean. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're working with something like this, it's just so fun uh, to be able to add something that, again, takes it another, another direction. And so you get this beautiful little dessert. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's just so pretty and, and mm. just the way it is. You get the flavors, um, the the caramel, the vanilla, uh, all of this comes really well together. So I'm pairing this with the Seven Daughters Moscato. And Moscatos are kind of like a sweeter Sauvignon Blanc. So you get a little bit of that grassy sweetness out of this, and but it's not... Um, it, it's not really sweet, sugary, but it has that acidity to it that kind of works well with all the flavors, with the oat cakes, with the mascarpone, with the dripping um, uh, caramel vanilla bean. Mm. Oh, this if you outrageous. haven't tried this. This is outrageous. Oh, I hope the people from Fat Toad are watching this. <laughs> this is like an ice cream sundae mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without the ice cream. It but is the, goat, the goat caramel gives it another 
Yeah, it takes it in another direction. It does. It, it's not like this. It's given it another flavor that's really phenomenal. Well, I think truth be told, <coughs> we didn't have the vanilla bean up here. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're doing it with cinnamon, fat mm. toad cinnamon caramel. Mm. And mm. That's, that's a winner too. Mm. I'm very fortunate that uh, Fat Toad Farm is a sponsor. So um, they had sent me an entire line of them. Mm -hmm. So I was able to pick anything that I wanted from that. And another direction I was going to go was with the cold coffee. I think the cold chocolate coffee would be really amazing with this as well. Oh. But the vanilla bean, you know, because you see a lot of um, Madagascar vanilla in mm -hmm. the mascarpones anyways. So that's kind of the traditional thing that I wanted to go down. I, I Again, I wanted to respect that this has got traditions of, of quality and that if people have never tried mascarpone on the oat cakes with a little bit of, you know, if you can't get fat toad, uh, well, you can get mm. fat toad. You just go online, fat toad farm, and you, you'll have it. But, and they're, they're little, they're only two ounces. So, and this thing's going to last me like four years. You know? <laughs> it's just, it's so rich. Uh, you know, well, I mean, you we know. go through this pretty quickly. I'll tell you, <laughs> they, we, we got the big one here and, um, and it's goat's milk caramel. I mean, yeah. I, I think that is just ingenious. Ingenious, yeah. and what a labor of love too. You know, the, the obviously dedicated small producers and. Um, I like their story too. They started out as um, homesteading. Oh. Yeah, and oh. they were grow. Uh, they were raising goats, and then they hit upon this recipe, and this product idea, and. They, you know, put all of their attention and switched over to making this product. Mm -hmm. And now they're buying their uh, goat's milk from, um, you know, local farmers. So they're pretty uh, cool. Yeah. Well, it's funny that uh, uh, on Friday, I'm doing this with Mary Quick from England. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the pairings that she said is she says, oh, I... I I don't know if you can get it, but I have this uh, Fat Toad Farm Caramel. I'm like, yeah, I can get it. We'll <laughs> I that. have a connection. <laughs> I got a connection. But the thing <laughs> is, is that with this, you can take this any direction that you want. You can mm -hmm. make this, you can put fruit in here. You could use the black and blue. The black and blue would be amazing with this as well. So there's so much diversity that you could literally, I think, I, I don't think it would be impossible to be that crazy to say that you could do this every single week, one day a week, 52 weeks, and have a different dessert each time using mascarpone, using the oat cake, and mm -hmm. then using a different spread or topping. Right. Yep, for sure. I see, I see apple butter with it. I see mm -hmm. pumpkin cream, butter, mm -hmm. cranberry, cranberry chutney oh, yeah. or something like that. Give you mm -hmm. the tang. Yeah. That was phenomenal, Michael. Love that. Well, you know, yesterday I was uh, considering using the Taste Elevated candied oranges and rosemary. And again, I think that that would be just uh, another direction to be able to go in that would just be so much fun. So, um, you know, we have a lot of options with this and your oat cakes are, you know, my staple. They are the base of any, any, simple entertaining dessert uh, i'm not, I'm not going to spend hours baking when you've already done all the hard work <laughs> thank you, you know? yeah so my like dogs to my dogs appreciate it too <laughs> all right <laughs> well um you know the the puppies only get uh cheese uh they don't they don't get anything mm. else even though that they would love to have a little bit of the uh fat toad but no would, no they're already they're rescues, so they're already on that edge. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think of the Moscato? This was delish. Mm -hmm. It's, um, to me, I know you're saying it's a little acidic. Um, I have, mine is a little, um, not so much, and, and there's a lot of fruit in there, mm -hmm. a lot of fruit. I'm loving it. It reminds me of something else. What is it? Almost like a oh, sparkling cider. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, without, uh, the, without the effervescence. Well, it started out effervescent, but I poured it earlier, so it lost. I'm sorry. <laughs> Truth be known, I don't, I don't want to. There was some effervescence in it. Got it. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. Well, I, I think that this would be a great, simple, easy dessert for anybody that wants to elevate their dessert, but also at the same point, take advantage of the hard work that you've done and making a simple dessert that I don't, I just can't imagine that everybody just wouldn't love. It's yeah. Just that good. I agree. Thank you, That's Michael. Terrific. Thank you for bringing that forward. That was, uh, that was huge. Yeah. That's my pleasure. Can we do this again? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to hear Mary on Friday night. Is that Friday night she's going to be here? That's well, actually it's Friday at 10 a.m. Oh, okay. Because of the time change that they have, uh, mm -hmm. we have to do it in the morning. But it'll be recorded like ours, so you will okay. be able to watch it, uh, you know, at another uh, time shifting. So it'll be on YouTube, Michael Landis Cheese. And so you'll be able to see that. I got Mary and Poppy, so it'll be really fun and, and uh, you know, entertaining with Mary because Mary is very entertaining. So. Right. Yeah. Right. She's great. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're tasting cheddar from cheddar, you know. You're tasting the real cheddar. Mm. This is... Yeah, bandage yeah. Up, yeah. beautiful cheeses, yeah. Nice. Great. Well, we're we're like learning it. so much from you, Michael. This has been phenomenal. It's really been great. Well, and, I, to, and to I, pair I, it with the beverages, too, and it makes a huge difference. It, beverage pairing uh, brings some flavors together. And my guideline that I always tell people when they are pairing something up, especially the first time, if they've never paired something up, you know, start with something that you already know and love. So if you have a wine or a beer that you just love and it's the same style, in other words, I, I did the hop, uh, hop Stupid. So, you know, you could pick up an IPA. So if you're a big IPA fan, pick up your favorite and then try it. So if it doesn't work out perfectly, you still got a great beer. Yeah. 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 This is true. Yeah. You know, that's, well, that's very sage advice. And the other thing is, is that when you start with okay, you you're just not going to go wrong no matter what you do. Sounds good. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Well, thank uh, you very much, Michael. This has been really tremendous. and A uh, lot of fun. A lot of fun and a yeah. good opportunity for us at Effie's and the team. So um, thank you. Well, I can I can always tell that when we're when it's going really well that we're pushing uh you know I think we're at about a, an hour or something now so mm -hmm. uh, you know that's 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 great I, I really like that so, so we're having there, a good party we're, we're having a good party our our Wednesday night now it's after five so we can okay <laughs> um, so before we run off is there anything that you would like to say. You know, we, we love what we do, yeah. and um, we love, I say a lot of times, I never get tired of the look of, like, delight when somebody takes a first bite of one of our biscuits, and we meet a lot of people at um, these events, and when they approach us, they're kind of confused a little bit, like, oh, what is this? And we'll just say, you just have to try it. You tell me. Is it a cookie? Is it a cracker? Just try it, you tell me, and they'll take a bite, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, this is delicious, and it's just, I love it, I still love it, and uh, so any opportunity that we get out, especially these days, you know, we're not, we're not uh, out in public so much, and I can't wait until we, we can do that again in person. Mm -hmm. I want to just add um, our gratitude. Um, to the people that support us and um, whether it's a retailer or, or distributors that purchase our product, but then ultimately the consumer, um, you know, it's your feedback that, as I mentioned earlier, guided us through a, not just a rebranding, but, you know, just we listen. But, you know, it's we have a lot of passionate followers that love our product and appreciate what we do. And we certainly appreciate it. I mean, we, as Irene said, we're friends that reconnected and 
let's try this business. Let's give it a shot at the worst time the market could, you know, it's like, and if anything on that end, it's like, um, you know, one foot in front of the other, you got to do it. You got to just keep trudging along and doing it. And that's what I think everybody's doing right now and trying to wave through what this, um, current situation with the pandemic is, 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 uh, bringing to us, bringing to light. But, um, in the meantime, um, great gratitude and, uh, thank you everybody. And thank you, Michael, seriously, who's a black circle right now or square. There you are. Thank you very much, Michael. This has been fabulous. It's always fun to see you. Uh, you know, it's funny that, you know, when we go to, the, when we're at the shows, uh, I run by, I get a hug, we talk for mm -hmm. a couple of seconds and I run off and, you know, we never do get as much time. And uh, actually, this is the most time that we've ever been able to spend together. Mm -hmm. And it's thank been you. the best time that we've ever, that I've ever spent with you. And I just thank you so much for entertaining, bringing this to us. And uh, thank you. I, I love you both so much. Oh, thank you, Michael. Love you too. This is great. This is great. Thank you. All right. Well, be safe, take care, and uh, we will reconvene in the very near future. With other pairings, and you be safe too. Thank you very much for everything. All right, I will. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Gypsy Circus Cider, and uh, we're going to have Stephanie Carson on. She's going to talk about their ciders along with some really fun pairings on that. And then Friday, uh, early in the day, this will be a 10 a.m. version uh, with uh, Mary Quick from uh, Cheddar, England. So uh, she's out in Somerset County, so we'll be able to see her. So take care, be careful, wash your hands, wear a mask, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.